untimely figs, I think is a message that we need to look a little closer at this morning. Ol unthos. It's a Greek word probably you should learn. It's used two times in God's word. Once in the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. Don't turn there. That's, we're going to go to Luke. <laughs> so I'll tell you in just a moment. And the second place it's used, hear me now, in the Septuagint, which is to say our Old Testament, but the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4b. So, in the older manuscripts. Ol unthos. Do you know what it means? It means green figs. Too early to harvest. Unfit for harvest. So, what is the implication simply in Olenthos? There are going to be a lot of people harvested when they're green. That is to say, way too early. Too early for harvest. Meaning what? They're going to be harvested by the spurious Messiah because they are biblically illiterate. Untrained in the word of God to know the chronological order of events. And it's sad. It really is sad. We're going to pick up, at it in, pick up in the 13th chapter of Luke. Let's turn there at this time, if we may. And we have a little bit of a bridge here from the parable of the fig tree to this particular, once only in the King James, use of uh, Olenthos. Chapter 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. This is Christ teaching. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Now, this certain man is Christ himself, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He is the owner of the vineyard. And he had a certain tree planted. And he came and sought fruit thereon. What did he find? He found none. It wasn't a producer. Verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, this is John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, the dresser of that vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. That fig tree is God's children. You could even call it Israel if you wanted to, but it is God's children, all of them. And I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? How much, look how much room it's taken up. Get it out of here. Well, in God's house, how much room do you take up? Think about it. You know, in your daily life as one of God's children, are you informed concerning his word? Do you produce fruit? That is to say, plant a seed maybe occasionally. To someone that comes up to you and asks, what do you think about where the dead are, or something of that nature. I only use that as an example. That's planting fruit. That's producing fruit. Verse 8, and he answered and said unto him, this would be the prophet through John the Baptist, the spirit of Elijah, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. Now, let me teach it just a little more. Let me try to get it founded in a soil that will produce fruit. Verse 9, and if it bear fruit, well, great. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Whack. Gone. Into the fire. Get rid of it. Now, be not ignorant of this one thing, that a thousand years of ours with the Lord is as one day. And we have three increments of time here, knowing, as you know from God's word, that we're very near. We're in the final generation, I have no doubt. That's approximately 2,000 years, plus we have a millennium is three. And that's when the tares will be burned along with those that would not ground themselves in the love of our Father. In his word, in his truth, it's a very final thing, a very final thing to be cut off, cut down. 
and not have eternal life. So, if we look at this, we know we're coming upon a benchmark that makes producing fruit. I am so happy, I don't want to say proud, but I'm so happy with, with um, the fellowship that we have around the world at this time with thousands up on top of thousands of people that are producing fruit. I think our father would say, hey, you're, you can do better, but you're, you're getting there. You're sure doing a lot better than in the past. And of course, with his blessings, we do that is taking the fertilizer of truth and planting it into the minds of people. And of course, what is truth? It's God's word. That always, you can guarantee it always produces fruit. You may get a door slammed in your face, and this doesn't mean I want anybody to be going door to door, all right? You, you can get your nose damaged that way, all right? But... When God sends some, God is in control. He will send the one he wants to ask you a question or to, and then don't, don't, uh, you know, dump the whole load on them. Fish. You know how you fish? Gently, you know, you persuade them. You don't chunk at them, all right? So, with that thought in mind, let's go immediately to the word, the Greek word that I wanted you to learn today. All un unthos, all unthos. Revelation chapter six. And you know what's happening here? The sixth seal is being opened, and that is when Antichrist appears on earth. Fix that in your mind and meditate on it. That's when the false Messiah appears on this earth, Revelation chapter 6, verse 13. 14 declares the sixth seal, I'm sorry, 12 declares the sixth seal is just open. And what happens? It's important that you note the actual events that transpire. Because God gives us signs and messages in the natural events that are spoken of, whether by analogy or physical, natural, in a physical, natural sense. Verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth. We know that stars is utilized as children. We know this is talking about Satan and the false, the, his angels, the fallen angels. Even as a fig tree casteth her all false, green figs. Two early figs harvested out of the season. When she is shaken, what caused them to be harvested green? Shaken. Shaken of a mighty wind. Not just somebody bumping against a fig tree with ripe figs on it when they go plunk, plunk. But a green fig doesn't turn loose that easy. You've got to get it a pretty good shaking to shake loose green figs. That means a violent shaking in most cases. So, there's a whole lot of shaking going to be going on. And the main thing is, how easily are you shaken? What does it take to shake you up? What does it take to throw you off balance? I'll tell you what will throw you off balance quicker than anything. is to not keep your focus on God's word to follow, to have nothing better to do than, um, study is always good, but focus on the message, the subject, and the object that God wants you to draw from it, not a bunch of inventions or imagination by man, though it's good for you to have a good imagination. Don't let, what, what am I saying? Don't let that be your focus. Oh, I learned something really new today. I learned that we're not going to rapture out of here. In, are we going to rapture in a green or a white body? Well, what difference would it make? All right? Let's make a whole new religion on the green and the white bodies. And young people, I'm jesting now, all right? I'm being 
silly. But we can all be silly if we don't focus and learn to study God's word by subject and object. That way you reap what he wants you to have planted away up in this little thing that oftentimes doesn't stretch to the limits we would like for it to, to absorb what our Father would tell us. So, if you're easily shaken, you might stop and think about it. But that makes me nervous. Oh, it does. That offends me. Oh, poor baby. Just terrible. You know, get on the rock. And that rock is Christ, and you don't shake there at any time. Because he doesn't shake. And I tell you again, consider it a warning. A great shaking is coming. Watch, check, and look at your foundation. Solidify your little old pinkies where you got a good grip on that foundation. How do you do that? By being firm and solid in the word of God, whereby you can answer men. You can answer for yourself as far as what in the world is happening in this world today. It's all written right here. Check the word. All right. So there you have it. And don't ever forget that untimely, as it is used there in the Greek, all unthos means green figs, not fit to harvest, got shook off in a great windstorm. Way too early. What are you going to use them for? Nothing. Now, we're going to Isaiah chapter 34. And in 34, verse 4b, and if you don't understand what I'm saying, when you rightly divide the word in the manuscripts, you have an A and a B in the fourth verse because we're changing the object just a little bit. Meaning in the closing part of the verse. I'll give it an oversimplification. We're going to have that word in the Greek in the Septuagint. What is the Hebrew, though, that you would have in your King James? Wilt. Which is fine because what does a green, what does a green fig do that falls off before it's mature? It wilts. Because the water source is cut off. That's just, God makes things real simple for us, doesn't he? If you just stop and think about it, that's what's going to happen to people that are deceived uh, in the very near future. So let's turn, if we may, to Isaiah, that great prophet of God, on his chapter of the Lord's Day, the last day. And let's look at it a little bit. Again, let's look for signs. Let's focus on what God is telling you concerning the end, because you're living in it. Therefore, it's important to you. Verse, chapter 34, verse 1. Come near ye nations. Now, did it say people? No, it said nations. So that's who we're addressing. To hear and hearken you people, you people of all those nations, listen. Let the earth hear. And all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. In other words, that is all inclusive of the whole, every nation in the world. And the peoples of it, listen. Listen to what? Listen to God's voice. This word, verse 2, for the indignation of the Lord is upon the nations. Again, people... I mean, Christians have such a way of getting on guilt trips. <gasps> He's mad at me. No, they said nations. All right, focus. Nations. And his fury upon all their armies, he hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Now, he's going to identify these nations in a moment. This is um, placed here by divine ban. God's going to do it. But how does he do it? Sharpen up. Three. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their corcuses, and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. Now again, we're talking primarily to, about nations. I don't have to remind you of Revelation chapter 19, the closing verses, 
where the one world system is cast into the lake of fire. Remember what happens to the nations? God destroys them. In other words, perhaps an oversimplification, God's going to destroy Satan's role as false messiah and the one world system, and he will not be afforded that power again, except at the end of the millennium when he's released for a short season, and then he's got to cut it on his own. He doesn't have that much um, deception to play with other than what he personally can cast forth upon the people. So, why do I say that? Because I want you to focus on what God is talking about. What's going to happen in this world whereby you're not surprised? Verse 4. And all the host of heaven. Now we're changing a little. We're not talking about the earth and all that is therein. Host is multitudes of heaven. Shall be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down. As the leaf falleth off, the, off from the vine. Part B. And as a falling fig from a fig tree, as a green fig, all unfoss, picked to green. What's a scroll? It's a book. What does it look like? A scroll is a book that is written on scrolls that are rolled up on, we'll call them spools, all right, just for the sake of things. When you pull it out like this, and na, 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 you read, when you turn loose of it, what happens? What's he talking about? This earth and heaven shall end. It's going to roll up like a book. It's over. Done. Finished. And I say that so that you stick with the subject, so that you focus on it. What are we talking about? The end of this earth age and heaven age. Both. All right? You know when that transpires. You already know that from God's word, that it's at the end of the millennium, but also that this particular dispensation, meaning until the second advent, will end before that. So we have to fit into this. What's he talking about? All right? It's going to be over. Let him now tell you how. And it's a bunch of poor old green figs. Don't ever forget about them. Feel sorry for them. But I feel sorry for them. Let that, let that encourage you to plant seed in people's minds. That they find a platform rather than to be sucked in, harvested early by the wrong Messiah. Verse 5. For, this is really important, beloved. Listen to it closely. Think upon it. Meditate. Focus. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. What is that word in the Hebrew? Well, let me just say it's Esau. Okay? Edom is red. It has to do with the blood. It's Esau. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. The Kenites are the people of the curse. Amos chapter 6, verse 14, There will be a curse upon you from the entering in of Hamath, which was the father of Rechab, which is to say, which is to say the father of the Kenites, would be on us until you know how to scratch them off your back. Did it say, this is very important, did it say God is going to do this? Did it say, I'm going to do this with my bare hands? No, he said, I'm going to do it with my sword. <coughs> what is God's sword? Huh, let me see now. Let me think about this. Well, his sword comes from his mouth, and it's two-edged. It's his word, this word. And that's what you plant seed with. In other words, these things will be accomplished through the word of God. And if you produce fruit, you grow skill in this word. Doesn't mean you have to memorize it. But you had better be well know how to focus 
on the subject and the object that God wants you to draw from it rather than what some idiot might be trying to instill to cause a little sensationalism. Have you ever thought of it from this angle? And, and it's totally, uh, has nothing to do with what God would have you draw from it. This is not a time to be unfocused. Do you know what happens when you're unfocused? Everything gets blurry and you might grab the wrong knob. All right? If you're a pilot, that could be bad. All right? <laughs> but whatever. This does not only have to do with Russia, the way it is written. It has to do with everybody that isn't producing fruit. All nations, because the subject was opened up, Again, not only to Edom, just because Idumia is mentioned here, but all countries that do not align with the plan of God. All right? Or, back to your prime root, lo um thos, green figs harvested out of season. Pray that your plight be not in the winter. Why? You don't harvest figs in the winter. Do you understand? You harvest them at harvest time. Okay, the sword of the Lord, that's what accomplishes it. Continuing then with verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats. These are sacrificial animals to this point. With the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. Do you know where Basra is? It, what does it mean? It means fortress. A fortress of whose? Edom. We're talking about the land and system of Russia under its anti-God stand is what God is talking about here. Of course, things are changing. But yet, stay focused, stay tuned. And a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Now, what did God just say to you? Focus on it. He mentioned sacrifice, and God's sword will sacrifice. It'll prepare a sacrifice for you. He's talking about sacrificing nations. That's the subject. That's what we're talking about. And you don't, again, as I'm telling you, you don't have to wonder when that's going to happen. You've read the 19th chapter of Revelation, and you're very familiar with it. And you understand the lake of fire, for our Father is a consuming fire. But what did he do? Did God say, I'm going to come down and I'm going to stomp on them? I'm going to spread them? No, he said, my sword. Do you know how to carry that sword? Do you know how to carry that sword with love? Think about it. Think about it. Verse 7. And the unicorn, the, the word unicorn is not in the manuscripts, it's wild ox. This throws a lot of people off and they say, well, they're mentioned in the Bible. No, they're really not. They're really not, okay? A unicorn is a mythical, uh, dreamed up thing that doesn't exist, okay? A wild ox very much exists. We'll come down with them and the bullocks and with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness in other words in the hebrew the earth will it's going to be so much the earth will actually be uh, uh, fertilized with their blood all right but again we're talking about nations now letting blood of nations and the sacrificial animals are being mentioned so that you get the connection in other words, when God is tired of man playing government, he's going to install a government on his own. And he is going to make mincemeat out of man's traditions and man's governments. Not that our government isn't wonderful, and I'm so very happy to be a citizen of it, but we're referring to those that gather into a one world system under what? The early harvester. Who's the early harvester? The spurious Messiah. What prevents him? What, what prepares the sacrifice? The sword of the Lord. This word. It prepares people's minds. As John was fertilizing or dunging 
the dumb fig tree that wasn't sharp enough to produce fruit to, through that spirit of learning, which is to say the spirit of Elijah. That's why it's written in Luke 1.16 that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. But he wasn't Elijah. Anytime you plant a seed, in a sense, that spirit is upon you. That's the purpose, is to turn the hearts of the children back to the true father, not the fake. If you read the very la one of the very last verses in the Old Testament in Malachi, it said to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural. There's two of them, the fake and the real one. So, which again has to do with that very important Greek word that says so much, green figs. But his sword, verse 8, for it is, boy he makes it real plain here, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion even gives you the geographical location of headquarters. But do you remember when Jesus stood up in the um, synagogue and he opened to the great book of Isaiah and he read, this time has this come to pass that he came as Savior. He didn't finish the last part of the verse because it said, and then comes God's vengeance. That's what this is all about, is talking about the Lord's day and God's vengeance upon man's atrocities, man's poor excuses, and the controversy. What is that controversy? The controversy between Satan and Yahshua. Verse 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. That's to say Satan's government. Why will it become burning pitch? Again, you've read, you've read Revelation 19. You see, you know a lot more about this than you realize, perhaps. Because it's going to be in the lake of fire. You bet it's going to burn. And again, remember what we're talking about. Governments. And thank God, you know who the, what the government is that's placed in this place. One king, king of kings and lord of all. Your troubles will be a lot easier sledding at that time, not to say they're over with, because in, during the millennium we still got work to do. Taking names and all that sort of thing. Teaching, all right? Ten, it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. What do you call a national... No, that, that's wrong. A cemetery for nations. Now, not a national cemetery, but a cemetery for nations. Well, we could look back at history for a moment. They don't exist. Let's take one that God ended, Pompeii. A great city government. Beautiful town, modern. I mean... God plugged in Old Mount, what was its name? Yeah, and here it went. He turned the lights on and then off. It doesn't exist anymore, you know, except in rock. There are people down there. <laughs> My point, and I'm, gonna, I'm really, by mentioning people, it simply means the demise of man's systems. Won't that be great? Think about the House of Reps and, and the Senate. <laughs> oh. We have a good form of government. There's a few of them that that might be fitting, but there's a lot of them that are real fine people. Okay, But man's government's through. At least ours is taken from the Constitution, which was taken from this word. Sorry about the digression. Eleven. But the Comorant, you know what that is? That's an old pelican, all right? And the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. 
You know, sometimes I wish I could really, I wish we could all speak the tongue that our ta father taught in through the prophets. Because one of these birds' name is made up from our word vomit. It's not made up from our word vomit, but the, uh, what is it, G-A-G. -G. It almost does come to think about it, that's gag. <laughs> well, and you know what the pelican does, okay? That's what God thinks about this. I, should I, no, I won't say it. A bunch of regurgitation. He's not, by, what do I mean by that? He's not giving a very pretty picture of what he intends to do, okay? But there's something else that's very important. I want you to take the word line, and in your margin, I want you to write measure. I don't want you to forget this. That's why I want you to write it. That's what it is in the Hebrew. The word line means to measure, like you take a line and you measure something, all right? And down where the word stones is, I want you to write the word level. I'm pulling from some ancient manuscripts here. And where the word confusion is, I want you to write tuhu. T-O-H-U. And where the word emptiness is, I want you to write buhu. B-O-H-U. Now, I know you've heard me use the term tuhu va buhu before. What does this really say then? Let me translate the whole thing for you. Out upon it, the measure, he's going to stretch out upon it the measure of Tuhu and the level of Buhu. You can't, that means to become void and without form. Okay? That's just like it said, God did not create the earth, tuhu vabuhu, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. That it became there. He created it perfect. And because of Satan, it became void and without form. That's what he's saying is going to happen to the nations that do not align uh, or are not ready to accept the owner of the vineyard. Okay? Now, verse 12. They shall call the nobles thereof of the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all our princes shall be nothing. We're getting pretty close, friend. It is written that the leaders will have the minds of babies in the end times. And if you really apply common sense to many things, and how we can stretch out and cause and talk about things for a year and never do anything. When common sense in God's way says, think up the best plan you can, try it, and hey, if it don't work, get rid of that sucker, you know, and try something else that will work. You can call on them, but they're do nothings. What he's saying is it's gone and so are their leaders. 13, and thorn shall come up in her palaces, nettles, and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of owls. Filthy, dirty, uh, unclean for food uh, type things. Fourteen, the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island. And the satyr, satyr, shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl also shall nest there and find for herself a place of rest. I wish I could give you this as some, some of the people that write. This is Lilith. I don't know how many of you have heard the word Lilith. I think in the, in the Arabic it is Dalilith. You know, a lot of people say that was Satan's wife, all right? The, Feminine, when the feminine is implied here, I mean, let, me, let me make this real clear. When the feminine, and it is in this particular case, Lilith was the little demon that liked to frighten children in the night. And it's mystic, all right, mystic. But it carried through, it did carry through. But when the feminine is utilized here, it has reference to Edom, all right, Adumia. So that you understand that. I mean, forget about the 
God is talking about sacrificing the nations, and we got animals here that are unfit for sacrifice, and that's what he thinks about the nations of the one world system. Okay, you got that. I don't want to frighten any children. That's scholars having fun, I think, mostly, in satire and the vampire and Lilith that lurks in the darkness. There is no such thing, all right? Except when you look at it from the demonic sense, then think about it. It's all right. Verse 15. Again, I want to emphasize herself. When the feminine is used, it's referring to Edom. So you'll follow this on recheck. 15. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Listen carefully, 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord. That's his sword. That's the sword that will get it done. And read. No one of these shall fail. Every one of them will come to pass. None shall want her mate. In other words, this sacrifice of these so-called unfit nations will be sufficient. Each one of them will have a mate and they'll have a lot of little ones. For my mouth, for my mouth it hath commanded. Again, what comes out of his mouth? His word, his sword. The sword that will accomplish this. It must be started is what he's telling you. And it is the sword that makes the beginning. For my mouth it for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. This sword of the Lord, do you remember when it was placed back in the Garden of Eden? Remember what that thing would do with cherubims there, and it turned, and it fanned, and it protected? It was his word. And when you know what that sword protects in your mind of what actually happened in the Garden, it opens a key to this entire word the sword and you can accomplish a lot with it so what do you search the mind of man the mind of some nation you want to really hang it all on the nations when God said they're like a they're all the, uh, most of them that go against me are like regurgitation to me and he's the general hey he's the one you want to please no, you want to be on the right platform that God is pleased with you, that he does not consider you a part of that that will be cut off and cast away, but a citizen of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. I will measure with Tuhu, and I will level. That's building with Wuhu, as far as man's ways are concerned. Don't, don't put any, don't worship anything that man builds. Worship your father and his nation. It is written, verse 17, And he hath cast a lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. There's that measure again. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Only unclean things, no more people. Why? It, it's just simply a figure of speech of saying the nations are going to be smoke forever and ever. That system. And as you deeper students, you know from Revelation chapter 12 that the same system Satan headed in the first earth age. It's, it's documented in the first three verses of the 12th chapter of Revelation. Now, did God say this anywhere else in the New Testament? Of course he did, over and over and over. But I conclude with Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12. While you're turning to that 12th chapter, this is where Paul said we're going to gather in a cloud, which means and run this foot race. And we're going to win. We're going to be champions. And he said in verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, 
who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He didn't care about our father's heritage. And the word profane in his, his identifier here is male prostitute. Now, females don't have to worry about being the only ones called a prostitute in the Bible. There's a male prostitute for you right there in the Greek, brought out full and clear. I want to go to verse 24 and listen carefully. It's self-explanatory of the 12th chapter. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the, book, the, to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And Abel's blood crying from the ground, Cain, kill me. His blood frees us. 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Who? Christ. For if they escaped not who refused him that uh, spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. In other words, Moses gave us the word of God, law on earth. Christ gives it to us from heaven through the Holy Spirit as he spoke to Paul as an example and many others. 26. Whose voice or sword then shook the earth, but now he hath promised... This is why I don't want you to worry about a thing. I don't want you to be uptight. I don't want you to be anxious. Saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. There's a great shaking coming, friend. But you don't have to worry about it. Why? 27. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing. It's a good purpose. The removing of those things that are shaken, those old green figs that will plump down, be drawn off by deception, their ignorance of God's word, as of the things that are made, that's to say created, that God created himself, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. If you are in this word, if you wield this sword... You cannot be shaken. That's why I asked you earlier, what does it take to shake you up? Think about it. There is a real, I mean a serious shaking coming. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom, the real one, not that one, not that little of... Uh, those kingdoms we were just talking about in Isaiah 34, which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That means produce fruit and not be shaken when the... He doesn't want to shake you. He wants you to pick up that sword and use it. Check the record. Be familiar with it. Be a can-do type person. Don't get shook up just because things don't go to suit you, but rather see that they suit our Father and all those other things he will add on to you. You will be successful. Do you know why? Verse 29, For God is a consuming fire. But that same fire that burns, that that is evil, is the warmth of his love as he touches you, as you have felt him touch you with the Holy Spirit giving you guidance, direction, and warming and comforting and loving you, your soul, whereby you don't shake at all. Why? You're a servant of the living God. And anybody that would let Satan shake them up don't amount to much anyway. You know it? There are better things in this life we can handle those things. Just be patient with them. Sometimes they hurt, you bet. Hey, you're a human being. We were made in the image of God. He gets hurt too. Gets his feelings hurt and so forth. But we can handle it. And we will always handle it. Because we know beforehand, we cannot be shaken because we are standing on the rock that doesn't move.
even though the wor world is shaking and in ignorance and not understanding what's going on. We understand why. Our Father told us. No big deal. Father, we thank you for the written word. Thank you, Father, for your truth. Thank you for foretelling us all things through the prophets. We ask your blessings and give you thanks for revealing to us through the word. And it is you that does it, Father. We know that. And we give you the thanks and the praise for it. To use each and every one of us throughout the world, Father. That thy sword glistens in the final generation. We ask it in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen.